It's good to see everybody here this morning. My name is Jim Welch, and I've been serving over the past three months uh, in an interim capacity um, uh, uh, at First Church. Uh, I've got only a couple more Sundays left, and I begged Ken and Anthony if I could come preach at least one time in this horse, okay? And so they allowed me to come today and uh, share the word with you. I've been preaching through the Beatitudes. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus gathered his disciples together and preached to them. Uh, one of the longest sermons that he has, in fact, the longest one, uh, and the Beatitudes are part of that. Uh, Beatitudes are given to a group of sayings by Jesus found in Matthew's gospel. If you'll take your Bibles out, and if you didn't bring your Bibles with you, there's a pew Bible in front of you. Uh, take it out and turn to Matthew, the fifth chapter, the seventh verse. Uh, let me give a few words of introduction to the Beatitudes before I get started specifically on the one I want to share with you today. Um, these, uh, these Beatitudes uh, through the years have meant these kinds of things to the church and I think to, to all of us as well. They are, first of all, uh, they are a reflection of who Jesus is. If you're looking and trying to describe who Jesus is, one of the best places to look is here in the Gospel of Matthew and the description of these virtues or values that Jesus carries in the world. The second thing to say about the Beatitudes, and this is important for us as a community of believers together, these are the virtues that if the church lived up to its high calling in Christ, these are the virtues that would be expressed in the church. If you want to know what the church ought to look like, now don't get me wrong here, know what the church does look like, but what it ought to look like, this is what the church ought to look like. These are the virtues that when people come and visit with us, uh, or uh, people from the outside see the church, they would say, we recognize these folks as Christians because they live in this way. So it's a reflection of who Jesus is. The second thing is, it's a reflection of who the church ought to be at its best. The third thing is this, these are the virtues that ought to be lived out in the life of individual believers. If I live up to my high calling as a pastor in the church, and if you live up to your calling as a baptized Christian in the church, these are the virtues that other people ought to see uh, in you. When I was ordained, I was ordained, and these are fancy kind of words, but to spread scriptural holiness across the land. There's a good Methodist Wesleyan term where I'm called to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus, in a way that spreads scriptural holiness across the land. Now, for modern ears, that runs, uh, sounds quaint, or even worse than quaint, it has no meaning at all when people hear that notion of scriptural holiness. What does it mean to be holy? What does that mean for us? If I'm called to live a holy life, what does it look like? Well, here it is, friends. The Beatitudes describe what it means to live a holy life. Each of the Beatitudes begins with the word, the English translation is blessed. Blessed is the Greek word there is makarios, which can be translated in different ways. And it got that translation of blessed early on, but it has meanings other than blessedness. Newer translations of the New Testament have this word translated as holy. You got me here? Holy are these folks. This is the reason of virtues of holiness. But there's another translation as well, which I think also ought to speak to us. This word makarios is also translated as happy are. Okay? Now, some translations go even further than that. The word makarios has a meaning that conveys a really strong emotion. And the strong emotion that it conveys here is, oh, the bliss. Not that any of you talk that way, okay? but that's what it says. Oh, the bliss. Oh, the deep joy I have when I live in this way. This is a description of who Jesus is, who the church is as it ought to be, and who we are, and a recipe for the deeply joyous life that we all seek, the holy life. Isn't that an interesting uh, comparison of words? Holy, happy, joyous? But that's what gets said here as Jesus teaches his disciples. I'd like to read all the Beatitudes with you today and not just the seventh verse, which I'm going to be preaching from today. Jesus saw the, mount, the crowds. He went up to the mountain. This is the fifth chapter of the first verse of Matthew. 
He went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The word poor in spirit here really means blessed are those who carry some humility in life. I described it in this way. The, the ones who are humble are people who can say, you're God and I'm not. Okay? Too often we place ourselves and our own uh, wants and needs in the place of what God's expectations is of us. The poor in spirit are those who elevate and have appropriate understandings of who they are in relation to the Lord. The next one is this, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Another curious word that gets translated, the word mourn here really means those whose agony is greatest, those whose hearts are breaking, and not breaking for themselves, but breaking for others around. That's a curious thing to say. I, got, I preached a whole sermon on it, so I don't need to get started and preach it again today, but blessed, joyous, holy are those whose hearts break when others hurt, okay, is what this means. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Perhaps the most unfortunate of all the translations, meekness sounds like mousiness. Okay? It sounds like you got no backbone in the world, but that's not what the word means here. The word praus, P-R-A-U-S in Greek, is, that translated as meek actually means blessed are those who are always angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time and keep their emotions under check and under God's control. You see the difference in that meaning there. Blessed are those who get angry at the right things. We ought to be angry when people are treated unjustly. We ought to be angry when people are treated and oppressed in ways that drive them down and divide people's uh, uh, lives in uh, nefarious ways or treated in nefarious ways. And we ought to be thrilled and excited. Blessed are those who are never angry at the wrong time. Like uh, getting angry this morning where they got cut off in freeway. Yeah, you, you all understand that. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness over right things. This is also the strongest word that can be used for hunger and thirst. These describe people who are so hungry that when they sit down to a meal, rather than asking for one piece of bread, they just grab the whole loaf. They are so hungry. Or so thirsty that they drink the whole pitcher rather than just a glass. Blessed are those who are so hungry and thirsty for doing the right thing for righteousness in life. Then today, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. You all say it with me. You can memorize the scripture passage today. You ready? Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And today, friends, I pray that the Lord would bless us as we share together in his word and bless us as we hear that word proclaimed in our hearts and our lives by the Holy Spirit. Now, you can look at me and you can tell that I am older than most of y'all. Okay? Um, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but I was born in 1950. How's that sound? Okay? I carry some age in my bones. So when Anthony, God bless him, where'd he go? Okay, Right there, Anthony. When you start singing about dry bones, you didn't say anything about dead bones. So I know you did, okay? Uh, about sinews that are worn out and knees that, and, and hips that are, don't work too well anymore. I mean, uh, that's kind of the way that I feel of, about that. I go back for a ways, and I know some songs that most of you probably do not. In the little church in which I was raised in, just a little uh, ways away from here, uh, over in East Harris County, in that little church, uh, we sang out of different hymnals, um, uh, different than the ones that you have in the back of your pews. Uh, and one of the songs that often got requested was a song called Showers of Blessing. Later, when I was serving in rural communities, particularly in farming communities, this is a, 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 a hymn that farmers requested all the time. And when you hear the words, you'll know why. This is how the words go. There should be showers of blessing, it goes. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops around us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Now, farmers blamed preachers when there was not enough rain okay? and said I wasn't praying hard enough when it didn't rain enough, but they also said I didn't pray hard enough when it rained too much. It was a no-win proposition. But their expectation was this for showers of blessing. Some of you may remember another song that, uh, that came out as part of a musical based upon a, 
real early song written in the 1930s called Pennies from Heaven. This really dates me, 1981, a musical written with Steve Martin in it called Pennies from Heaven. These are the words of Pennies from Heaven. Every time it rains, it rains pennies from heaven. Don't you know each cloud contains pennies from heaven? You'll find your fortunes falling all over the town. Be sure that your umbrella is upside down. Okay? This song reflects an expectation that some have in life that miracle things are going to occur. And if I have my umbrella upside down, that is an optimistic stance that things are just going to fall into my umbrella. Now, these things that I've mentioned, pennies from heaven and showers of blessings, are hardly the same, but we wish that they were divine grace in tangible form. Don't you wish for that? Don't you wish for tangible grace, a divine presence in our lives that comes in real things? Though I have to admit, who today wants pennies, okay, or just showers from blessings? We're more inclined to sing with our favorite singer, blues singer from Port Arthur, Janice Joplin, these words. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a what? Come on, y'all help me. Man, I thought maybe a cat got your tongue. Okay? Lord, won't you buy me what? Or Mercedes Benz. My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. Worked hard all my lifetime. No help from my friends. So, Lord... Won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? These days, we wouldn't ask for a Mercedes Benz. You'd probably ask for a Tesla, okay? But Janis Joplin wouldn't be able to find a word that rhymes with Tesla, so it probably would still be a Mercedes Benz. Comedy like this, sometimes pathos, likes to toy with the idea of good things that come to us from on high. that are just kind of dropped in our laps. Fairy tales and songs relish the theme. It's even been taken to great extremes by cults throughout the world. During World War II, there developed in the Pacific Islands a groups of people that were, uh, their religious life was built around what are called cargo cults, the Melanesian people. These are folks who, upon the arrival of soldiers or sailors that came into their island homes, confused greatly the affluence of the soldiers that they saw, or they confused the affluence of missionaries that were in their midst, expecting a new age to dawn with the arrival of provisions like these missionaries or these soldiers have that simply dropped out of heaven. Maybe you've had it, maybe not, but visions of a supernatural store which comes to us all of that can be explained as a fantasy for us in our world. Or it can be explained as greed or misunderstanding, like with the cargo cults. But in any society that's influenced by Christian thought, even if those thoughts are whimsical or selfish in nature, if they envision God generous beyond limit, all of those things suggest a uh, a, a recognizable virtue, a fundamental attribute of the Holy Lord. And that attribute is mercy itself. Let me see if I can describe it to you. Mercy has all kinds of definitions for most of us. Sometimes it's used with the same breath as justice. Justice and mercy bound together, married together is the way one phrase puts it. Those two words have complex interplays that have existed for a long time, particularly in the language of law or theology. But each of those terms are distinct from one another. Justice usually means fairness. It means being fair about things. In legal and political terms, fairness of the, is the goal when justice is put forth as a human right. Justice has another meaning as well, beyond fairness. It can also mean righteousness, which is not the exercising of a right, but a condition of being and doing right. A righteous man, a righteous woman, is one who in their being itself does and is the right thing. 
God in our Christian practice and in our belief is the very heart and essence of what it means to be righteous. The Bible describes the Lord over and over again as a righteous God. And as a righteous God, he is a God of justice and of mercy as well. Let me give you an example of this. Scripture talks about a God who separates the sheep from the goats. Scary teaching, scary notion. Those who follow after him and who don't follow after him will be separated. But he's also a God who demands justice among people and nations. As an English term that translates a set of Hebrew and Greek words, mercy is something different than justice. Mercy is a quality that goes beyond being just. It is justice plus, justice plus special consideration. That concept is also found in the law. For example, when an offender convicted appeals to the mercy of the court. In theology, in our talk about who God is, it's more than heavenly jurisprudence. Mercy is first God's grace and forgiveness freely given to a humanity that does not measure up to God's expectations of our lives. It's a gift freely given to us of forgiveness, even if we don't measure up to God's demands of our lives. Mercy in this sense is not owed to us by God. It can't be said to be a human right, nor can it be earned. Mercy, according to scripture, is like a divine bonus that comes. And it springs from a decision rooted in what we see in Jesus of God's intent to forgive sinful people in the world. Mercy, then, is God's love for us expressed in his forgiveness of us even when we are at our worst. Mercy is one more thing, I think, as well. It is God's identification with the poor and with the oppressed, with the marginalized in our society who are victims of human injustice, God reaches out to those poor and broken. What we believe as Christians and what's expressed in the Beatitudes and in this particular Beatitude is this, is that Jesus is the fullest expression of God's mercy given to us, both in forgiveness and in consideration of those who are downtrodden. Our Lord is both the sign and the promise of God's love and forgiveness and the way in which we can enter into a new relationship with our God. Christ heals us, uplifts us. He touches the broken and despised in the world. In everything we read in the Gospels, when you read the New Testament, it is Jesus who is the epitome of justice and of mercy itself. He is the critic of the rich and the powerful, but he's also the forgiver of sins. He's the lover of unlovable people. He is the physician to spirits and bodies. Reading the New Testament closely, the Gospels closely, what you'll discover about Jesus is that his choice is to hang out with those who are at the margins of the world. That's who he heals. That's who he touches. That's who he calls. It is Jesus, the one who forgives Mary. It is Jesus, the one who calls Peter. It is Jesus, the one who speaks to Paul on the road to Damascus. He has compassion for outcasts in the world, but his mercy, friends, knows no bounds. If you go back in the New Testament to Jesus' first sermon recorded in the Gospel of Luke, that sermon is based on a text from the prophet Isaiah and announces as part of his mission that he has come to bring good news to the poor, the release from captivity of those who are uh, captives, sight for the blind and liberty for the oppressed. The fifth beatitude, blessed are the merciful. 
recognizes the Christ-likeness of those who give mercy in who they are and in how they behave in the world. Now, the Greek word for mercy rendered here means to render aid, to give aid where aid is due. And Matthew 5, 7 is often applied to those who respond to the trouble in the world with help along the way. It's the Christian responsibility, we think, to feed the hungry, care for the strangers, clothe the naked, and to tend to the sick and the imprisoned. We as Christians are called to be great humanitarians in the world. We are called to be those who reach out to those in need and to offer mercy where mercy is needed the most. But our motivations are more than humanitarian. Our motivations are a little different than that. Our compassion, our service, is always initiated by the mercy of God granted to us. We serve our Lord by serving God's children. But we also recognize that that is rooted in Christ's forgiveness of us, in Christ's compassion for you and me. The awareness of Christ's presence in our lives, the awareness of Christ's power in our lives means that we can stand with those who suffer even when their suffering is at the worst. I want you to listen to a prayer prayed by Mother Teresa of Calcutta. The prayer is called, Jesus, my patient. Dearest Lord, she prays, may I see you today and every day in the person of your sick and while nursing them, minister unto you. Though you hide yourself behind the disguise of the irritable, the exacting and the unreasonable, May I still recognize you and say, Jesus, my patient, how sweet it is to serve you. Justice may be required by the law, but mercy goes beyond any legal requirement we can assume. Human mercy is modeled on Jesus. There's no social pressure that can make us be merciful. It's beyond any human expectation. It is a gift of grace in our lives lived out in love and service to others. When I finish here in two weeks, two more Sundays after um, this Sunday, um, third week in July, I've been invited of a group of 14 people, 14 men, to bring um, a a ministry to death row, sort of unusual opportunity. We'll be on death row uh, for two full days, expressing God's love and grace to these men, and these are all men, to these men who've been sentenced to death. Justice may require, or fairness may require that they receive that penalty, but mercy requires of me that I extend to them God's love and grace because God's love and grace is extended to them wholly as it's been extended to me. Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. A mercy that goes beyond being fair to serving others in their need. Blessed are you, for you too will receive that mercy. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, I pray today that in your grace in our lives, we might ourselves be called to mercy, to extend and render aid to those who are in need, to those who are broken and lost and afraid and hurting in the world, to those whose sin has captured their lives and from which they cannot escape, who hide behind the prison bars, not of steel, but the prison bars of their own emotional lives. May that grace, O Lord, extend to them by our extension of your mercy, the mercy given to us. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord, who exhibits that mercy for us and lives out that mercy in this church. Bless us now, we pray, and may we all say together, friends, amen.